This morning's message is an interesting one, I think. It, uh, it, it, it prompts me to, uh, to, to say to you what I know about what we do not know. That sounds interesting, doesn't it? <clears throat> Have you ever been to the movies? Uh, maybe it was one of those uh, uh, thriller kind of movies or scary movies. And one of those people in the theater watching with you was having a conversation with the characters on the screen. Uh, just at the moment that, that the character on the screen is about to go through the door, they say, don't go in there! <laughs> See, we know what's about to happen. The writer knows, even the, the, uh, the actor or actress knows what's about to happen, but the character doesn't know. And if you go back and see the movie again, even though they have been warned and they have seen what's on the other side of the door, they will go through it again, and someone will likely say, don't go in there. All of our attempts to warn them are for naught. What happens on the screen cannot change. It has been settled since the final cuts fell on the floor in that cut room. I was inspired this week by a couple of uh, contemporary philosophers, if you will, uh, one of whom asked the question about knowing. Now just in case you're wondering, it wasn't Plato and, and Aristotle or Socrates. It wasn't even uh, D.S. Warner or E.E. E. Byram from the church uh, world. It was it was Frank and Ernest from the comics. Oh, sure. You see them sitting there on the, on the mountains, wise men sitting on the mountains, and one looks at the other and says, here's a, a brain teaser. Is it possible to be enlightened and not know it? Is, is someone walking around there and they've got all of this wisdom and they really don't realize what they have? It got me thinking that the old saying, you don't know what you don't know. We, we don't know. What we, and even when someone tries to tell us what we know, we may reject it. There are a number of things that we've discovered in this life. See, we understand the principles of the natural world. Gravity, for instance. We, we know and understand that what goes up must come down, unless, of course, it goes really far up, and then it doesn't have to come down at all because it has exceeded the limit of the law of gravity. We understand the principles of mathematics. Two plus two equals four, although common core apparently is questioned. We know in a general sense what the weather will be like today or tomorrow, but we can't know specifically about that. If you watch the weather, they'll say it's a 20% chance or maybe an 80% chance. But even then, if it's an 80% chance, they can't tell you where it's going to rain and where it's not going to rain. It's only <laughs> an estimate, a guess, about what's going to happen. It's still knowable because eventually we will understand and know that. And I believe in a spiritual sense it is possible for someone to be lost and to believe that they are saved. They believe that they've given their heart to Jesus at some time in the past, and yet they are going to find on the judgment day that they were mistaken, deluded by their own sense of what happened. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said to some of them, 
Depart from me, I never knew you. I think that's exactly why Paul encourages us to make our calling and election sure. And yet I believe as well that we can know for certain whether or not we're headed into an eternity of joy or an eternity of suffering. We can know that. We surrender to God's saving grace and then demonstrate the holiness which comes from the infilling of the Holy Spirit whereby we become more and more like Him every day. But there are some things in this life that we don't know. From a human perspective, there's a lot. There are things about history that even though we should have recorded it when it happened, we're uncertain about what happened exactly. We conjecture about them, but of course, we may be right or we may be wrong about what's happened in the past. Scientists dream up all sorts of scenarios to describe how we arrived here at this time, at this place. They call them theories. But a theory is simply an unproven idea. If, listen, if it were no longer a theory, it would be called fact. Most of what is thrown around in our day and time is, is called fact, but that doesn't make it fact. It's just an unproven theory. However much evidence may be lining up with it, it's still just a theory. Some uh, scientists have discovered a process which, which might have led to the Big Bang, they say. The uh, particle accelerator at CERN, Switzerland, the Higgs boson particle was noted in 2012. Say Higgs boson? It, it's, a, it's an unknown and unknowable quantity that we have a theory about. And at the particle accelerator, they take two particles and slam them together as fast as they can and try and notice if perhaps there was a Higgs boson in the mix. And the only way they can tell they can't observe the Higgs boson, no, even though this, this, this particle accelerator has value in the billions and billions of dollars, they cannot see this particle in itself. No human built equipment can see it. All they can see are the effects of it, if that's in fact what it is. Now in all fairness, the scientists theorized in, in, the, in 1963 that there was a, a thing called Boson, called the Boson, and it was Mr. Higgs who theorized it. It was he who first developed the idea that there was this, this thing in creation, in the world, in the universe, and this thing is the thing that gives everything else mass to it. So the only reason that we're here and we have anything is because of this, and hence it has been titled the God Particle. Now, the scientists don't like to call it that. It's just the media that like to call it that. But it's the thing that gives everything else its function and meaning. What scientists saw in their experiment was the latent effect, the trails of something that is otherwise unobservable. And yet, what they saw was exactly what they thought they would saw if there was a Higgs boson. So they say, well, it, it must be since we had a theory and now we have exactly what we expected that this thing might have existed. Of course, as I was watching on the, the YouTube video this week, they said um, you, even though we accelerate the particles and they collide, it doesn't always produce a Higgs explosive particle. Only one out of every 200,000 times that we collide particles will we see one. 
And yet, although they have never seen this particle, they still believe that it's there. <coughs> it sounds like the description of faith from Hebrews chapter 11, right? Faith is believing what we have not seen. They have faith that something is there. Scientists are now theorizing that that in light of this Higgs boson, which they have observed the effects of, they said that the Higgs boson contains 126 billion electron volts. It is 126 times more powerful than the proton. And we know about the energy that comes when we split atoms. And this Higgs boson has 126 billion times more energy and power. They believe this particle, which is too small to see, has enough energy that if it were to become unstable, it would create a vacuum, a rift in the universe, and that it would continue to spread until all of the universe disappeared. And even though they believe that might happen, they still continue to play with it. Why would you do that? If you think that the, the Higgs boson particle is, is on the verge of instability, why would you play with something which might create a chain reaction that would unravel the very fabric of the universe? There's no way to stop the chain reaction once it starts. They have no idea how it might start, and yet they continue to experiment. This I'm sure about particle physics. They don't know what they don't know. In fact, they say all of our calculations could be wrong if there is some law in the universe or some principle of physics about which we have missed in our calculations. They don't know what they don't know. For all of our supposed research and insight into why the world exists and how we came to be, there is so much that we do not know. More than we really know. This idea of the, the Higgs boson and the the universe unraveling sounds a bit like 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Where he says, and when Jesus returns, the known universe will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with fire. See, we already know what becomes of this world, this universe. God has already told us about that part. He just hasn't told us exactly when that's going to come. Now I say all of that is a, is a background for you. What we do not know in Scripture, what Scripture tells us, we do not know and will not know and cannot know. There was another thought that dwelled up in me. I thought for sure that when I went to Scripture that there would be a lot of things that, that the Scripture would say we cannot know or understand. And yet I found that there was just one thing. I thought I was going to have a sermon with three wonderful points and maybe continue it next week with three more things that we can't know. And I found one. So I had to add in all the extra stuff in order to give you that one. Scripture talks about all kinds of things that we know about God. It tells us about His love. It tells us of His creation. It tells of it, His plan and provision for salvation. The Bible speaks of the battle between good and evil. and tells us a great many things about the end of this existence and what will happen when the end arrives. But we don't know when. 
And if we don't know what we don't know, how can we be sure of what we know? The greatest unknown from Scripture is the hour of the Lord's return. We know that it will happen in a moment. We just don't know which. John chapter 14, Jesus is talking about His departure. He's there on the, the night of the Last Supper. He's in the upper room with His disciples. And He's telling them about His departure. You all have memorized probably that passage of Scripture from John chapter 14. When it says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto me. That where I am, there you may be also. And Thomas scratches his head and he says, says Lord, I, I don't know where you're going. You've, you've talked about something, but I'm not sure what you're talking about. And if I don't know where you're going, how can I know how to get there? Jesus responds. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father, but by me. See, it wasn't so much where he was going, but with whom he was going to be. I'm going away in my Father's house, or many mansions. He's going away to the Father. This ragtag bunch of disciples who would all abandon Jesus in the hours that were coming, were wise and intelligent enough to know that there was a place that they had never seen, that they had never been, and they yet could not intellectually fathom what that place was. I think it makes sense that Thomas would raise his hand and say, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's where we get that, that you, you teachers, there are no bad questions. If you don't know the answer, you should ask. Jesus, however, had given them all they needed for understanding. And yet it would take them several days, 50 of them in fact, until the Holy Spirit came and filled them and gave them the understanding of what Jesus had. Called to remembrance everything that He had said to them and gave them the aha moment. The day the light bulb went on and they understood what Jesus was talking about. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is from another place. Jesus was going to the Father's house. Jesus was headed to heaven. We know that they didn't really understand on that faithful night. On that blessed night. And in part, we understand because when they finally got to understand, they left us a record so that we could read it and know it. I suppose if I had to summarize for you that what we don't know, it all has to do with the timing. Matthew chapters 24 and 25 are, are prophetic utterances of Jesus. They talk about the time of the end. And Jesus tells us many things about that time. He gives us clues as to what will be happening when the end of times comes. And even though He gives us those clues, He emphatically states that we do not know the day or the hour. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. I want you to turn there and read it in your Bible. Matthew 24. Verse 36. So that when you wonder again about Jesus coming and His return, you can go, oh yeah, that's, it's right here. We read that. Jesus says, no one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, even He, was not aware, but only the Father. 
As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And then look at verse 42, just six verses down. He says, because you do not know the day or the hour, therefore keep watch. Keep looking up. Keep waiting and understanding. We can read the signs. Jesus said when you see, you know that when the fig tree puts on its buds, that summer is near and that the fruit is about to happen. When you see the signs of the end of the age coming, you know that the time is near. And yet we have this problem because the disciples in the first generation, the first century church, believed that all of the signs had been fulfilled and that Jesus was coming back in their life. He could come, if you will, at any moment. We know it will be soon. In fact, it's, it's closer now than it's ever been. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be this week or before the end of the year. The believers in Thessalonica thought He was coming in their lifetime. They left their homes and their jobs, their work, and went out onto the mountainside to, to watch for His coming. And then... When the end of the day came and Jesus had not returned, they would come back to their brothers and sisters in the Lord and they would say, you know, I've been out watching for Jesus. He didn't come today and, and I haven't been to the grocery store. Do you have any, any extra bread or some meat that I might partake of? And the next day they would go and do the same thing and they would go out and watch and then they would come back. And, and Paul chastises those who were lazy, those who were idle, those who were not working, just because we're watching the sky for His return doesn't mean that we should stop working in order to be good stewards of the time that we have to take care of our family and our basic needs. He told the church there, he said, if a man doesn't work, there's no reason for you to have to Shall not <coughs> Yes, Jesus said that the Lord would come like a thief in the night. He would come when we weren't expecting Him. He would come and break through the sky on a day and a time when only those who were waiting and watching would be ready. We expect it at any moment, but that does not mean that we should be idle. Rather, it means we should be faithful until He comes. He should find us living in holiness, empowered by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. He should find us faithful in our affairs with our family and within the household of believers. He should find us faithfully managing the affairs of home and work and the kingdom when He arrives. Yes, we know He's coming back. We know this part. What we certainly don't know is when. And in fact, everyone who has ever predicted the time of His arrival has been wrong. Because he already told us no one knows the day or the hour. No one knows. Those who predict are not listening to God. Because it is, not only is it something we don't know, it's something that is not known because it's only in the mind of God. And when it's time, He will alert the angels and He will
he will alert the son, and he will say, go. And then, we'll see them. And this, as well, will surprise the world. It should not surprise us. Even though we, we didn't expect it this moment, we do expect it. Listen, are you ready? Are you prepared if he should come back today? Are you part of the number who know that you know that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is living in your life and in your heart? Or are you some of those who wonder When he comes back, will I be on the right or the left? Will I be rewarded or punished? Does your life demonstrate that you know him and that you're ready for inspection? At any moment, he can come through the sky and announce that it's over. Time is over. Time has been completed and eternity has come. Do you know what your eternal destiny will be? If not, I implore you to come today to be saved. To come to His altar and find that assurance that transcends all knowledge that today You've made your life right with Him and that tomorrow you will continue to live in that. And once you have prayed, once you have made that decision, once you have made that commitment, do as Paul has encouraged and work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Demonstrate yourself to be a wise servant and not a foolish servant. For the wise servant, we're told, will inherit the kingdom. And the foolish will have a place in the outer darkness where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Listen, we do not know when but we can know that we're ready. We can know that we've got the oil that the wise virgins had, ready for the time when He comes. We do know if we have the reserves, so that when they say the bridegroom is coming, we're ready to go with Him. There's nothing else that must be done. 